This is a KOAT Action 7 News Commitment 2022 debate special. Welcome to debate night. This is our commitment to you to make sure you cast a vote knowing as much as you can about each candidate. I'm Shelley Rabando. And I'm Doug Fernandez. June 7th, New Mexicans go to the polls for our primary elections. Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham wants a second term in office. Five Republicans want the job, and the primary election whittles it down to one. So in June, we'll know which of these candidates will face off in November with the governor. They will also be up against a libertarian. Karen Bedoni ran for Congress previously as a Republican, but switched parties for the governor's race. We are joined in our KOAT studios with members from our media partners, the Albuquerque Journal and KKOB Radio. I'll be on the panel asking questions, along with Bob Clark from KKOB Radio and Dan Boyd a reporter with the Albuquerque Journal. Tonight you'll hear from all five Republican candidates. We here at KOAT and Hearst Television have a policy that everyone who enters our building must be vaccinated. So for that reason, we are doing the debate over Zoom. Just a quick note about our rules tonight. Everyone gets up to 60 seconds for opening and closing statements and 90 seconds to answer questions. And only I can call for rebuttals. When time is up, the candidate can finish the sentence and my decisions as moderator are final. All right, candidates, the order for opening and closing statements was determined by a hat draw. Mark Roncretti goes first. You have one minute for your opening statements. Doug, thanks very much, and thanks to Channel 7 and all the groups involved in this. Look, the fact of the matter is we have elites in Santa Fe who no longer listen to your voice. And even worse than that, the policies they advocate make life here in New Mexico far more difficult. From the border to crime to education, we have groups right now that are in charge of our government that absolutely bring chaos in many cases to this state. Our crime is out of control. We have the free flow of fentanyl up through the southern part of the state, along with human trafficking as well. Our kids have been in school far fewer days than many other of their peers over the past couple of years, and there is no plan right now to catch them up. What is there a plan for? Bigger government. The government of the state of New Mexico has never been bigger than it is right now. And what I would ask you is, has that made your life better? The answer for most people is clearly no. We have to build a movement to take this state back, and this is the candidacy to do it. Mr. Block, your opening remarks. Thank you, Doug, and thank you, Channel 7, and uh, all those watching out there in New Mexico. Many New Mexicans today are hurting. We are worse off today than we were four years ago when this governor was elected. It is time that New Mexicans had strong leadership with integrity and with experience. I am the only candidate that has leadership in the senior levels of the military and in elected office and in public, private, the, public, the private sector. It is time that we finally had leaders that were not political elites, that did not trash each other. We didn't have a governor that trashed our state and was condescending to us. It's time that we take our state back. New Mexico can do better, I ask you, to support this campaign. It's a grassroots campaign, and we will make this state better together. Thank you. Rebecca Dow, your opening statement, please. New Mexico needs courageous leadership, and we need it as soon as possible. We're last in education, highest in unemployment, and the MLG has opened our border to the criminal elements of the cartel. They're trafficking humans, smuggling drugs, and they're responsible for the abuse of countless women and children. And that's why Republicans are picking the next governor on June 7th. We have to get this right. Let's choose the educator, the job creator, the lifelong conservative who's never disrespected President Donald Trump or our conservative values. I am the only candidate in this field who's fought MLG and the radical progressives in Santa Fe with results. I'm ready to govern on day one, and on day one, I will ban radical cr critical race theory, redeploy the National Guard to the border, protect our community, support law enforcement, put parents back in charge of their children, and get to work setting New Mexico's potential free. Ethel Maharg, your opening statement, please. Yo represento más de 49% de la gente. Los demás no pueden. Only I have three-term executive branch experience. My competitors have zero. I'll end corruption, nepotism, and federal government overreach. Everyone in my administration will follow our state and federal constitution or get fired. New Mexicans' economy will manage our natural resources, regulations, jobs, and taxation better. Lawlessness will lose every bit of support. Immigration, if you sneak in, you'll be ushered out, period. Voter, re voter registration rules will be scrubbed clean, and every legal vote will be securely counted. 
I will create a bilateral commission on education to study the top three states and counties and implement who is who, what the proven methods are. Uh, we will graduate independent thinkers, no more indoctrination. Parents will use vouchers and choice for their kids. I will use my veto power to straighten out the mess corruption has made in our state for over 90 years and will see to it that life is respected. Abortion will end. It's overdue. Mr. Zanetti, your opening remarks. Hello, New Mexico. Many of you know me. We grew up together. We went to Valley High School together. And we love this state and we know how great New Mexico can be. Many of you know me from the military. From West Point, I mean from West Valley, I went to West Point and became the commanding general at Guantanamo Bay. For those of us who have worn the uniform, we view New Mexico through the lens of duty and discipline and defending our families, not just at the border, but from the criminals who didn't take the same oaths that we did to protect and defend. Some of you know me from the radio and business. Yeah, I was the guy who said, all this money printing is going to end badly. And when it does, we're going to have rising prices. And now here it is. But we also said New Mexico wouldn't be a victim. There would be a way for us to benefit from this. And some of you, you don't know me at all. But by the end of this debate, I hope you'll say, you know, that New Mexico general who's the finance guy, he's the one who's got the leadership skills to lead us forward. I'm voting for him. All right, candidates, thank you. Shelley Urbando has our first question tonight, which is focused on crime. Good evening. The state's largest city is in a crime crisis. What's the root of the crime problem and what's your solution? Please highlight specifics you would do. Well, the crime problem in New Mexico is affected by several areas. First of all, we must secure the border. I've been talking about sending the right uh, skill sets of the National Guard back down to the border uh, to assist the Border Patrol and local officials. I'm also the first candidate to talk about creating a new law enforcement agency here in New Mexico, the Border Security Agency that focuses directly on the border and partners with local, uh, county, state, and federal law enforcement. But to me, um, crime goes deeper than that. We have mental health issues, and we have homelessness is issues as well, and drug addiction issues. That all uh, goes into crime as well as a poor education system and, and a poor economy. You know, as a county commissioner in Sandoval County, we as Republicans and Democrats, no other candidate can say this, but crime in Sandoval County in 2021 was reduced in every single category. No other candidate has that record of working with law enforcement, which is why I have the most law enforcement endorsements in this race. I also have uh, Veterans for America First, which is focused on the border security as well, uh, their endorsement. We will in Okay, well, apparently we're going to have some technical difficulty with Mr. Block. We're going to continue out right now with Ms. Dow with your reply, please. Thank you. Crime, we have to secure the border. Border security is national security. The fentanyl that's free, fall, free flowing across the border is impacting all of us. Uh, I'm endorsed by six sheriffs, four of which are board I know that I will keep my commitments to back law enforcement officers. Uh, you talk about the root of the problem. Family is the number one indicator of, of, of success. And we have broken families. We have lawlessness. Children, Youth, and Family Services is where 60% of abuse occurs for children before the age of five at a critical time in their growth and development when it, it may end up having difficulties in school. And our teachers are spending 80% of their time with these 20% of the children who need our attention the most. They're becoming juveniles who are breaking into your garage. There's no consequences for their behavior. By the time they're adults, they're, they've learned that crime pays. And they're living in a city in Bernalillo where they have uh, elected officials who believe in catch and release, who put victims in charge or the criminals in front of victims, uh, judges who are not enforcing the laws on the books, legislators that are passing uh, the removal of qualified immunity and making it harder for our, our uh, law enforcement officers to do their job. We need to end catch and release, pretrial uh, releases. We've got to back the blue, uh, fund prosecutors, make sure that our courts and corrections have the tools that they need. And we've got to look at immediate and early interventions. Reforming CYFD is an absolute must if we're going to break the cycle and, and address the long-term impacts that drugs and mental health have right. in our community. Thank you very much. Your time is up. Ms. Maharg, you are next. Um, well, just, you know, I was the chief of police in my community at one time because uh, I needed to take that from the council who wouldn't allow me to do that. So I'm intimately aware of what it is to protect our communities. 
Uh, fighting crime is going to demand that we have just judges, which at this point, I don't believe that we do. We need to elect just judges and DAs and other uh, other elected officials, and we need to hold them accountable. Because at this point in time, as I understand, the sheriff's department, the, the police department, they don't even talk to each other, and that needs to end. And uh, just like the others, we do need to secure the border because from there, so much crime is coming across and the drugs and that is. But let me let me give you something else that maybe nobody else thought of. You know, in 1962, we took prayer out of schools. And since that, we had had a 700 percent increase in crime in our juveniles. In fact, most of the crimes that are committed are by juveniles, are by young people. So I suggest that we might consider a little bit of a, a moral change here, a little, a little moral compass and some more character development of our students of our people which grow up to be students, I mean adults, that also perpetrate the crimes. So uh, many of these, like I said, many of us are going to say the same thing, the border, uh, and we do need to do that, but we need to have elected officials that are going to do their job and hold the people accountable. We need to hold our judges accountable. Mr. Ronchetti, your reply, please. Doug, you guys asked what the root cause of crime is, and it's criminals. We have criminals that we catch we bring them into jail and we turn them right back out on the street. And we're not talking about people that are committing necessarily low level crimes. These are violent criminals that are being turned right back out on the street here. And the policies that this administration has advocated has made it far more difficult to be a police officer than it has to be a criminal. Remember, when this governor took office, we continued to see a climb and climb in the violent crime rate across the state of New Mexico. What was the answer from this governor? It was to target police and then make doing their jobs more difficult by removing qualified immunity. And by removing qualified immunity, what that really means is that police officers can personally be sued for doing their job. We have to back the blue. We have to tell them we will support them no matter what they need from us. We have some of the best law enforcement in the country here. And when you ask them, what do you need? What would help you? The answer is simple. They don't want more money and they don't want more guns. They want to know that the governor of the state of New Mexico and their leaders backs them up. And then we also have to address the border. There's no question about it. Many of you have seen our ads when we've talked about a border strike force. It's going to be 150 agents under the Department of Public Safety. Their job is going to be to stem the flow of fentanyl and human trafficking into the state of New Mexico, which drives a lot of our violent crime. It's not being taken seriously now, and we will. Mr. Zanetti, Mr. your Fernandez. reply, please. Well, let's think about what we've done here. Let's see, we passed a series of laws that basically made criminals victims and victims, criminals, that was step one. Let's see, then we emptied the prisons. We used to have, what, 7,600 prisoners in the state, roughly. Now we're down in the 5,000s, and we expect crime to go down. Then what did we do? Yeah, we all the talk about defunding the police in Santa Fe, destroyed their morale, qualified immunity, which other candidates have already talked about already. And then what else did we do? Let's see, we took away cash bonds. Oh, yeah, that led to the catch and release, catch and release that we all see that drives everybody crazy when you hear on the radio or on TV. Yeah, the guy's been picked up 18 times, and then he just did this. And then what was the last thing that we did? We stopped enforcing what we used to call petty crimes. How many of you have gone to Walmart? And you've seen somebody load up a cart full of stuff, and then they just walk out, and the guard's going, sir, oh, sir, and nobody does anything. Meanwhile, same on speeding and traffic violations. If you don't enforce the basics, what do you expect to happen? And so what did we used to do? We used to do it a little bit like the military. We had a uniform code of military justice. If you did a crime, there was a consequence. We took all of that away. And so I'd imagine there will be a border question here in a little bit. I can talk to that at great length since I was a general in the Mexican Army National Guard. But right now, can we fix all these crime problems? Yes, it's just gonna take a governor with some backbone. All right, Mr. Block, because of your technical difficulties, you have 25 seconds left, but we're not going to repeat the question, but you have 25 more seconds, please. Well, again, it goes back to securing the border, creating the border security agency, and bringing bail back and qualified immunity back. My county is the only county that has crime dropping in every category because we've, we've worked with this before. I'm the only one that has experience doing this, working as Republicans and Democrats. The other candidates talk about it, but they don't have no idea how to accomplish it. We've done it in Sandoval County. We're very proud of that. Dan Boyd from the Albuquerque Journal, your question, please. Good evening, candidates. Uh, New Mexico has seen its worst fire season in recent history. We have heard from so many New Mexicans with deep concerns about the future of wildfires. My brother is a wild, wildland firefighter right now, so he is actually on the fires up in Taos. So that one is like a big thing. 
Um, so just dealing with like the people that have to evacuate their houses and how they can get support from that is something that's big. Candidates, do you believe these fires are due in part to climate change? And do you th think the state's response to helping communities has been enough? And if not, what specifically would you do differently? Ms. Maharg, you go first. Thank you, Dan. Um, que dolor, me duele mucho. It hurts me so much to see my state go up in flames. You see, where I'm from, we have a farming community, ranching, and we also had uh, lumber mills, but they've shut everything down. So they have hurt the economy. They have hurt the people there. They have not let out contracts for thinning of this forest. This forest fire could have been totally preventable. And it would have helped our economy in this. The, price, the prices of homes right now are rising. They're going through the roof. That lumber could have maybe helped to curtail some of that. So, and it would also help our economy by giving people jobs. But these wildfires are foolishness beyond compare. When the federal government tells you to strike the match and the winds are going 100 miles an hour, do you think that that's really wise on our part to have done that? I don't think so. The governor should have stepped in right then and there and said, I'm sorry, but it is springtime and spring in New Mexico, it's windy. And you, we are not gonna strike the match. We need to have better forestry control, but they haven't. And so I think that the uh, blood, I guess, would say, or all these fires are on her. They're on her. There was nothing that she did to prevent this. And so I am holding her accountable. And I think we as a state should too. We could have done something much better than that. Mr. Ronchetti, you are next. Doug, we are entering the third year of a La Nina, and that is the single biggest impact on what we're seeing right now. We have well above average precipitation all across the state here. Spent my career in this field, and I'll tell you, what we're seeing at this point is the result of horrendous policy, especially extreme environmentalism. Remember, two years ago, we had people across the northern mountains who would go into the mountains to cut wood to stay warm for the winter. They were told they could not do it. And then eventually a federal judge had to jump in and say, wait a minute, these people need this wood. We have abandoned our northern mountains. And for any of you who have gone up there and hiked across the north or gone into the Sacramento mountains, even over into the Gila and seen what has happened, it's this extreme environmental policy of not clearing out deadfall that leads to explosive wildfires. And we did used to have a very large and robust timber industry in New Mexico. It is all gone and it has to come back here because we have the timber to do it and we have to do it to care for our forests. There's no question about that. And when you look broadly across some more policies from this governor, what she's tried to do on more than one occasion is drive this state toward California. That's what we're becoming. Remember, the last legislative session, she tried to go out and pass a bill that would have raised gas prices 35 to 50 cents a gallon, saying that this was for the environment. It wasn't. It's crushing. We're crushing so many different areas of business across the state in the well-being of people and driving up their energy costs. That's where we need to be focusing. Mr. Zanetti, your reply. We all know that this environmental movement now isn't about the environment. It's about power and control. And but lighting up fire and 30 mile an hour winds for a controlled burn. We all think that's crazy. You gotta wonder what were they thinking? But we get back to that, how are we going to do this? We have to start pushing back against the federal government and saying, wait, this is just one occasion you've done this. You've done this in our state twice in the last two decades. And now you've done it in California and Oregon and Idaho. When are the states, I believe we should do this, start pushing back against the federal government and say, we're taking control of our own lands we are clearly incapable of doing this. Our governor doesn't think like that, though. What he wanted to do was just pass out lunches, get on the front page of the newspaper, and say, oh, look how I'm helping. The reality is a very slow response, and now people are suffering. So it doesn't have anything to do with climate change. It's poor policy and poor reaction by our governor. We can change all of this. Mr. Block, your reply, please. Well, the climate's always changing. Uh, that's what the science is telling us. But the science also tells us that we have to clean up our forests and we do have to log and thin the forests because that protects the forest. We have lost over 270,000 acres of forest and have displaced so many people. I am the only candidate who has pushed back against the governor by sponsoring and passing a resolution to overturn her ridiculous executive order of the government controlling 30% of our land by 2030 and an additional 20% by 2050. 
this is where the leadership and experience comes in because I've worked with Republicans and Democrats getting this done around the state. The governor has, has, not, had, has not asked Joe Biden for any accountability. And if the federal government can't even manage this force or know when to strike a fire, why should we trust them? We have to have, the, we, we know what's best for our lands here in New Mexico, not Joe Biden. But MLG thinks that Joe Biden knows what's best for us. That has to stop. We have to protect our farmers and ranchers and our Native American communities who know how to manage and use these lands in a responsible manner. What we're seeing now is unacceptable. And as governor, I will push back against Washington, D.C. immediately. And we will not see this type of devastation and destruction ever again. Our final reply from Ms. Dow. We cannot control the drought. We can't control the wind and the weather. But we can do a better job of managing our land, our vegetation, our forests. And I believe that our farmers, our ranchers, and commercial loggers, and even the folks who get permits to, to warm their own homes with firewood, those are the true conservationists. But our governor is beholden to radical special environmental in, in, groups, and they're winning in Santa Fe. The everyday New Mexican is losing. Even as this controlled burn was started by the Forest Service, the largest fire in our state that's taken out over 200 structures that preceded New Mexico statehood. Look what it's doing to the climate. Look what that's, the fire's doing to the environment. What's gonna happen with our soil and how do we have restoration? Even while we're looking at this, this is just two years after Los Alamos, also started by the, for, the, the Forest Service. The National Forest is saying in Lincoln County, they've gone from 1,500 allotments of cattle grazing down to 100 over a field mice that hibernates 11 months out of the year. Cattle are part of conservation. Farming and land management is part of conservation. If I were the governor and I had $28 billion worth of COVID money coming into the state, I would have created jobs by thinning our forests, removing non-native species along the Rio Grande and all of our waterways, improved our watershed, and reduced our risk to catastrophic fire. She is responsible because she's beholden to radical special interest groups. She has left the everyday New Mexican behind. We need courageous leadership and we need it now. We continue with a focus on the state's drought crisis with Shelley Rabando. Shelley. Cloud seeding was recently approved for use in the southern part of New Mexico to increase rainfall. If successful, is this something you would want to see implemented statewide? Mr. Ronchetti, you are first. Yeah, cloud seeding is, I think, is a very good idea, but there are a couple things we need to know about cloud seeding before we put too much faith in this. First of all, certain areas for cloud seeding will be better than others, especially when you get into mountain communities, and you also have to have the moisture. Effectively, what happens with cloud seeding is you put silver iodide in the air, and that helps collect some moisture and helps to increase the amount of moisture that falls out of the cloud and onto the ground. So in some cases, we do see some improvement as far as results go, 10 to 15% improvement in some mountain communities in Colorado and in Utah here. Other areas have seen less success. So while it's something we should definitely invest in, we also have to continue to expand our investment in things like how we handle our water and making sure that we are very careful with our water. Right now, our water laws in the state of New Mexico can be pretty difficult to navigate. And too often, we don't necessarily follow a path with water laws that allows us to hold on to as much water as possible. And this is another area we have concerns with this governor. Remember, she had her state engineer basically walk away and say you're not committed here to what needs to be done to protect the water for the state of New Mexico. Our ranchers need it, our farmers need it, our municipalities need it. And as we work forward here, there's much we can do to handle water much more responsibly here. Part of it is cloud sitting, but another part of it is making sure we prioritize every drop from northern New Mexico all the way down to the south. Mr. Zanetti, you are next. I think most of your, your viewers now don't realize that New Mexico is the Saudi Arabia brackish water. We have billions of acre feet of salty water under our lands, and it's all over the state. It's in Farmington, it's in Las Vegas, it's down the eastern part of the state. It's in the Tularosa Basin, it's in the Mesilla Valley. We have salty water, and what we should be doing is what the Israelis do. They desalinate, and they bring the water up out of the, they do it from the ocean. We would do it from the ground. People say, oh no, Greg, it's too expensive. Well, just down the road in Fort Bliss, Texas, they deemed fresh, clean water a national security issue. And they said, Department of Defense will pay half, City of El Paso, you pay half. And they built a desal, fifth generation type thing. They're cleaning 30 million gallons of water every night for the base and for that community. Don't we have three Air Force bases? 
Don't we have two national labs, a missile range? We have Indian reservations. Why aren't we doing like the Israelis do? And why aren't we desalinating this water so now the cities aren't competing against <coughs> rural areas for the water? And watch what happens. New Mexico could become the water state. And that would be a stunner, and the kids would then stay because now, well, first, that water, you don't have life. And second, you offer, you'll have jobs, not just in the trades, but you'll have jobs in the high-tech desal world. That's what New Mexico should be doing with water and not just seeding clouds, which I'm for. But the longer-term solution, let's look at desal the way the Israelis Mr. Block, you are next. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Zanetti and I are, are very close on this issue, and I certainly appreciate Mr. Ronchetti's weather experience uh, on this issue, too. Um, I have experience as a base commander in the United States Air Force um, where we had a desal plant, where that water was critical to our operations, not just to the mission, but to the support of the personnel on that particular base on Ascension Island in the South Atlantic. I think this governor squandered away an incredible opportunity in 2019 when she had $2 billion of a surplus where she could have invested that in infrastructure specifically water infrastructure, because Mr. Zanetti's right. We've talked about this, him and I, numerous times about the aquifers in New Mexico. And this infrastructure uh, for our water is critical to our ranchers and our farmers. And that's what we're gonna focus on when I'm governor is water infrastructure. So yes, um, this is a huge uh, economic uh, security issue because we're seeing a lot of people in New Mexico down in the Southern part leave because they can no longer farm or ranch. But the water issue is also critical to our force. And again, we have to manage our force better. And uh, this governor has done just a horrible, horrible job managing our force and even investing in water. And that will start uh, in a block administration of supporting our water industry. Ms. Dow, you are next. Yes, cloud seeding is one of the options that we need to use. Water is life, and we need to use every avenue possible to conserve and improve our water situation in New Mexico. That means having a well-funded state engineer's office so that we can deal with lawsuits, but it also means uh, looking at produced, recycling produced water. That's something that we're incentivizing in New Mexico right now. Uh, there's a lot of produced water left behind from oil and gas, and there's technology out there that make that, that water reusable. Brackish water, desalinization, the studies underway at New Mexico State University as we speak. Desalinization is a huge part of what we need to do. But so is investing in our water infrastructure. If I had $28 billion in COVID money, knowing that the majority of our cities and municipalities have drinking water and and wastewater infrastructure that's up to 40 years old. Those have to be replaced. We also need to be looking at land and vegetation management, just not in the forest, but BLM and all public and private land across the state. One salt cedar drinks hundreds of gallons of water a day. And because our, our infrastructure and our ditches and our associations and our waterways, they're so, um, they're so old and decayed, we're losing water to evaporation we're losing water to absorption. And we can improve our watershed and our water management so that we can have water in our lakes. I mean, if we wanna have tourism, we need water in our, wake, our lakes. But this governor has ignored this and instead chooses to give payouts rather than looking at the critical resources we need to help us grow our economy and to keep our New Mexico's drinking water safe and affordable. And the final answer with this question is Ms. Mahar. Go ahead, please. All right, um, I agree with everyone what they're saying, and I have uh, list, I have also been doing some research. Israel has much of the same uh, topography, I guess, that New Mexico does, and they they're turning their 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 waterways into their having their wastelands and deserts into farmlands, and we need to be doing the same thing. And also, this goes back to the forestry management, and that is when you manage your forest properly, you have water available within the. Uh, the forest within the trees within the, the foliage that's in there so we need to be able to preserve that along with again answering the question that we had just that we just had before because when you have a healthy forest forest going on there that you also have healthy waterways and i was also responsible for providing water for the village of cuba when i was there i saw to it that they had all that they needed because that is the role of the governor is to provide the proper infrastructure of any government that you have uh, seating, Mr. Ronchetti would have the most the most uh, information there. So I am for what the things that are going to help solve that our water problems. But again, we do not need to be wasting the water that we do have. And I think that we need to produce 
ways technology, bring in technology that's going to do just like Israel did and produce great water. And it also improves the economy because it then provides jobs for the people that are have to be employed to take, take care of those plants. Bob Clark, you have our next question. Candidates, a yes or no question for you, or at least give it your best shot, right? Do you believe the election in 2020 was stolen from former President Donald Trump? Mr. Zanetti, you are first. I would say that there's a lot of smoke right now, Bob, and I know you want the yes or no answer, but the, ju the jury is still out, but the evidence is rising that the voter fraud was off the charts, and we deserve answers to these questions. And uh, I'll just say this, we go back about 20 years to the Gore-Bush election, and the Democrats screamed, it was stolen, it was stolen. There was a great investigation. There were all kinds of, uh, well, again, investigations to what happened, because people wanted to have trust in the system. Now the right is saying that, but getting the Heisman Trophy treatment. No, no, you're not even allowed to ask, ask the question. No, it, it's time for a deep dive into voter integrity. And uh, it goes beyond a yes or no answer on this. But smoke is getting thicker. We need to look at this in a very serious way. Because without voter integrity, we don't have a republic. Mr. Block. You know, um, this question was not asked in 2018 to Michelle Lujan Grisham, a Democrat, about the 2016 election. <laughs> Um, you know, now we see, now we see that this whole uh, Russia, Russia, Russia collusion was a complete lie where Hillary Clinton's attorney is, is facing criminal charges. So for us to look back uh, and to focus on a 2020 election is wrong because yes, there are, we need voter integrity and I, and I will put forward a voter ID bill and voter integrity bill in the state of New Mexico because we need it. And I'm working on eliminating some drop boxes in Sandoval County. I'm the only commissioner fighting, I'm the only candidate for governor fighting for this right now. But I am more focused on the atrocious record of the governor, the record of the worst education system, one of the, the worst states uh, rated to live in by U.S. News, uh, high crime, high unemployment, uh, an awful tax code that stifles businesses. And, you know, it's just, you know, it's just one of those questions that people don't really uh, care about because it doesn't put food on their table. We have record high inflation. We should be talking about that. But in 2018, you guys never asked um, Congresswoman Grisham at the time if the 2016 election was stolen. We had to live through that for four years. So I think we got to look forward to the issues now that affect the Mexicans. Rebecca Dow, you are next. Yeah. So if you haven't watched 2000 Mules, you probably should. Where there's smoke, there's fire, and it's. I think that we'll go down in history showing that there is widespread election fraud across the United States, and that without that election fraud, then Donald Trump would be the president, would have been reelected. And so I believe in election integrity. We need it to be easy to vote and hard to cheat. Voter ID and one vote for one legal citizen. Whatever it takes to secure that needs to happen moving forward. People need to have confidence in our elections. Ms. Maharg, your reply, please. I was going to say the same thing. Watch 2000 Mules. If you want to understand what took place in the in the 2020 election, because there's definitely proof that there was fraud and it's lots of it. And they also showed that New Mexico was a big part of it. And so um, I guess my short answer is I, I do believe that it was stolen. I think that it was wrong and we need to correct it. We need to have voter ID. We need to have uh, paper ballots. I think we should go back to that. And then, you know what? I'm asking everybody vote on June 7th and in person. If you want to stop this corruption and this crime, Vote in person and vote on June 7th so that you do not, you know, you can at least uh, stop some of that because we know that the Dominion machines are still out there and they're still doing what it is that they're going to do. But this will mitigate some of that. So go watch 2000 Mules Vote. Boy, it'll make your jaw drop. And Mr. Ron Ketty. You know what will also make your jaw drop? Watch Santa Fe and watch what this governor tried to do this last session. You want to talk about enshrining cheating. That's what this governor tried to do with her election bill. What did she do with it? What did she try to do? Tried to allow 16 year olds to vote, felons to vote, to send out paper ballots to anybody in perpetuity going year after year. And even worse than that, we end our election day on Tuesday night and she was going to propose that we continue to count ballots into Friday. What we have to look at here is people that are trying to just tick away at the integrity of our elections. And that's exactly what this governor has done. So the minute we get into office, what we want to do is number one, bring in a one line voter bill up in front of the legislature and say, it's very simple to vote in the state of New Mexico. You must show a valid ID. 
And we have 77% of the people in this state who agree with that. Yet we have a legislature who wants to go the other way, which is pretty much the way they operate. So does the way this governor operates as well. And it's not only that. We need to make sure that it is easy to vote for everyone who wants to vote here. And as we push forward over the next couple of years, we need to make sure that we do everything we can to make it difficult to cheat. Because if you take away the confidence of your elections, you take away the confidence of the electorate to feel like their vote matters. And that's the direction we're headed in. Dan Boyd from The Journal, you have the next question. A policy put in place during the pandemic could soon expire, allowing many migrants to cross into the United States to seek asylum. As governor, how would you treat our border in New Mexico? Mr. Block, you have the first reply. Well, again, as governor, uh, right away, I will be uh, deploying our National Guard back down there. Uh, you know, Mr. Zanetti and I are retired military officers. Um, I've had to deal with with borders and security uh, issues in the nuclear business as a nuclear weapons officer uh, using technology there to keep our weapons safe. And on the border, we're seeing a humanitarian crisis. We're seeing uh, sex, increased sex trafficking and drug trafficking. I've been down to the border several times in Texas. I've been with the border patrol and seeing minors come across from Honduras and Guatemala. You know, we're not testing these people coming across for COVID. Uh, they're not, the governor is not forcing them to have a vaccine, but she's forcing us to have a vaccine. This is a humanitarian crisis that is affecting our country because in 2021, we had the highest overdose deaths in the United States for drugs. And in 2021, we also had the most police officers killed in the line of duty. The southern border affects every single state in the country. Every state is a border state because what comes through New Mexico goes throughout the country. So I will secure the border as well. I'm the first candidate to talk about the border security agency, which is focusing on the border. But this is more about, this is not just about illegal immigration. This is about protecting those vulnerable people that are coming across and getting into the trafficking business. And I've seen it with my own eyes. And it's very sad and we have to stop it. And we must secure the border and protect this country. Rebecca Dow, you are next. Yes, I'm endorsed by four of the border sheriffs because they know that I'll follow through on my commitment to secure the border. I will implement the plan that was started by Donald Trump at the request of the border, uh, border agencies to finish the wall. That may take uh, electing a, a Republican governor, a, a Republican president, but I will continue to advocate that that wall be finished. The, what equally important to them is the cyber technology and the, the line in sight that they need to be able to respond to incidents in real time using technology. They want secure, safe roads with access to key access points so that they can respond to incidents in real time. They're asking for the National Guard to be redeployed because our law enforcement officers, they're highly trained. They have a job to do, but they're spending 60 to 80% of their time on comfort and care. We need to redeploy the National Guard so that they can get back to securing the border. This governor has, we need to ask ourselves, a governor who embraces and celebrates Biden open door border policy, does she represent the values of New Mexico? The communities along the border, they're not asking for a strike force. They're asking for real solutions. They're asking that they be heard and that they be listened to and that we implement the plan of border, that the border security, border agents want. And that is what I plan to do. Um, and, and there's nothing more important than securing our border. We've got to stop the, the gotaways, the criminal element, the human trafficking, and the abuse of countless women and children that are happening right here in New Mexico. Border security is national security. It's job number one. Ethel Maharg, you are next. Ooh. Border security is of utmost importance because without borders, there, there are there's unrest all over the well over the nation, and there's much talk about that it's a federal problem. Really, it is. The governor should have stepped in and sent the national guard and see to it that this state gets uh, the border fixed. Now, the thing is, Texas and Arizona are two adjoining uh, states are already fixing their border. They have taken it upon themselves. They said if the federal government's not going to do it, we're going to do it. We need to do it ourselves. And I know that there's a uh, talk that there's we're costing millions of dollars to do that. But I hate to say this, it's already costing us. When you have treatment for fentanyl users, for any kind of users, it's a uh, $20,000 per uh, rehabilitation for each person. You, you get a hundred of those people, that's $2 million a year in rehab costs just because of the fentanyl. That's not even just the fentanyl. That's all the other drug problems that we have there. So we need to secure the border. We need to make the people in our state, we must take care of New Mexicans 
first. We must secure the border so that our New Mexicans are, are safe first, and then the rest of them. Now, I will say about immigration, if um, I believe strong, and I'm a granddaughter of an immigrant, but my grandfather came here legally, and I say, if you sneak across the border, well, sorry, but you're gonna go across the back. We're gonna put you back. No discussion, period. Mr. Ron Ketty. Uh, luring vulnerable people to a porous border isn't compassionate, it's cruel. And you see it time after time with the Biden administration. What they've done is by rolling back Title 42, which is likely to happen here, we're likely to see a massive flood of more people coming into a very dangerous situation. And that dangerous situation ends up converting into a lot of criminal behavior here in the state of New Mexico as far as drug trafficking goes and as far as human trafficking goes. We have to address these issues. And this governor, the first thing she did when she took office in 2019 was pull the National Guard back and just kind of go, we're done with this. And that has been devastating. We are 600 Border Patrol agents short in our sector of the border here in New Mexico. And I don't know anyone who believes President Biden is going to address those hires and do what needs to be done. So we have to fill the gap here in the state and do everything that we can. So where do we get some of these ideas to try to figure out exactly what we need to do? Well, we need to work with states like Texas and Arizona who have implemented plans that are working in large measure, especially in Arizona. Arizona, and they have a sort of a border strike force that we have called for here too, that focuses on going after the fentanyl and the human trafficking as well. But make no mistake, the crime that we see across this state is often driven by a lot of that illegal drug trade. And that is not going to go away until we are able to take on the cartels and deal with that issue here in New Mexico. And finally, Mr. Zanetti. Well, I, I view the border through the lens of national security. I mean, if you're Putin right now, you really want to mess with the United States, what would you do? You'd be sending people in through the southern borders. This is far beyond just a humanitarian mission, which it obviously is. But I hear everybody saying, I'm going to deploy the guard to the border. All right, roger that. What units? Mm -hmm. uh, unit size, company, battalion. Uh, what's the chain of command? How are you going to integrate with Border Patrol? I saw the alphabet agency down there. Uh, what are the communication lines? How are you going to coordinate with Texas and Arizona? These are basic military questions. And an army officer, army national guard officer, like Zanetti understands. But there's another piece, to this, and it's the financial. How many of you in the audience believe that the Biden administration is going to pay the New Mexico Army National Guard to go down and secure the border? Nobody. That means we're going to pay for it. It's a state mission. Fine. That means that every dime that goes to a soldier isn't going to schools, roads, bridges, etc. By the way, just last month. Texas relieved its adjutant general because they had deployed their National Guard to the border in a half-baked way. They had a bunch of soldiers standing out in the dirt not knowing what to do, sleeping in sleeping bags on the ground, not getting chow, calling home and saying, honey, this is a sentence. What you need is a governor who understands the military side as well as the financial side. Otherwise, we'll end up tra draining the Treasury and not securing the border. I am for doing it, but we should do it in the right way. And we will be back after a short break when the candidates can ask one of their opponents a question. This is a KOAT Action 7 News Commitment 2022 debate special. The rules special. allow each candidate to ask another candidate of their choosing a question. Ms. Dow, who are you directing yours to? Um, I will direct my question to Mark Ronchetti. And Mark Ronchetti, uh, why did you say that uh, you left the Republican Party over the orange one? And you did say that. I, I know you've backstepped those. So were you were you being dishonest and disingenuous to a room full of climate can change advocates or now to the Republican conservatives that are choosing the next uh, our leader of our party? No, Rebecca, what I was doing is making a joke to a group of UNM students. And if we get to a point where we don't talk to anybody that we disagree with and we decide, no, 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 I'm not talking to these people or I'm not going to do this or I'm not going to do that because they're on some other side, then I can't help you with that. I think that's the problem right now with politicians in this state. And unfortunately, Representative Dow, you fall right into that category, which is you grab a little thing and you try to make political hay out of something when people in this state are absolutely suffering. When you look at across the board, fuel prices, when you look at inflation, when you look at what's happening with crime, 
Those are the issues that are important. Yet you've spent most of your campaign cash grabbing a joke and then running with it. And unfortunately, that shows where your priorities are. We need to focus on the people of this state. Too often, we have politicians who tick off what they do well, and they never think to ask the question about what people are dealing with. Look, I don't have this thought process where you look at the whole grand scheme of things and think how much of a politician I can be. I'm not interested in it. All right, time is up. Thank you. Mr. Zetti, your question for an opponent. Uh, Ethel, I'm going to ask you. Uh, okay. You've watched what's happened during this campaign, with all the negative advertising, and you've seen how we focused on the negatives. Of this so if, I'd like to know if you think that all this division, all of this friction, does anything to advance our state, to make the state better, or if it actually works against us? Uh, I think it's foolish. I think it's foolish for us to be fighting because at the end of the day, there's five of us right now, and on June 8th, uh, we're going to have to support somebody, right? So I think that we need to get our act together. I'm sorry, but we do. Uh, all this infighting has to stop. Uh, you know that I don't take part in it. You know that, Greg, that I don't. I've been asked by even media. They ask me, well, they've asked me questions like, uh, why doesn't Ron County show up? I'm like, I don't know. Ask him. You know what? Don't, don't call me to get mud on my fingers, okay? So the thing is, I think that it is wrong for us to be fighting like this. It's time for us. It's time for healing in our land. It is time for us to come together as a state and a nation and that we can do things right. And it's not going to help with all this acting like we're three-year-old children. Okay, next, Mr. Ronchetti, your directed question, please. I'll ask uh, Mayor Maharg a question as well. Mayor Maharg, you were a mayor of Cuba. You yes, have yes. a good feel for what small towns face, especially a small town that has been affected and seen their jobs go away. We need to reinvest in our small towns across New Mexico. What do you think we need to do, especially when we look at what's happening in Santa Fe, to advance what happens in our small towns and to bring them back? Well, you can't treat a small town, you can treat like the big city, because that's exactly what they do. And the infrastructure that is necessary in a small town, like I said, I was responsible for roads like the native New Mexican reservations, washboard roads all over the place. And you need to be able to help that community in the way that that community needs help. You need to be able to help the farmers, the ranchers. If you live in a big city, you need to be able to supply that. But in a small community, that community needed uh, like some main street help so that they could provide economic development because that's exactly what I did. I provided economic development that is still there today, 16 years later. And I also left him with almost $2 million in the bank when I left. So the thing is, what we need to do is we need to bolster the economies. We need, to, we, and again, don't treat them like you do the others. And Ms. Mahark, again, your question for one of your four opponents. For Mr. Ron Caddy. Yo soy la candidata con la más experiencia y tú no tienes nada. Tú tienes dinero, pero es todo lo que tienes. Yo puedo comunicar con toda la gente de Nuevo México y tú no puedes. ¿Por qué no me estás soportando a mí? Look, I, I think, look, experience is critical. There's no doubt. And we all have different experience. There's no doubt. My experience is different than anybody else's experience here. But I'll tell you what's most important in this. And who lives the life of New Mexicans? who has been through the things that many New Mexicans are dealing with. For those of us with kids, those kids, we don't just stick them on their bike now and let them go riding out wherever they wanna go. When my wife thinks about going out to get gas, we think, what time is it? Should we do this? And we have leadership in Michelle Lujan Grisham and Joe Biden that have that political experience that you all seem to tout so often. And what has it gotten us? Michelle Lujan Grisham's 25 years of experience has been absolutely devastating for the state of New Mexico. We have crime that's out of control. We have issues with getting good jobs into this state. And we have a president and President Biden who has been absolutely incompetent in every area of his job. So I'm sorry if I don't have the ultimate respect for political experience here, but it's absolutely critical to get someone without the steep ties to politics to start to change things in this state. Mr. Block, you you're question. next. Thank you. Mr. Ronchetti, I appreciate you talking about the steep ties to politics because you do have steep ties to politics with your consultant, uh, Mr. Jay McCleskey. And you have said that you would surround yourself with good people, but yet Mr. McCleskey has been investigated by the FBI for campaign finance issues. And he also had to pay out almost a $400,000 settlement against a Mr. Scott Chandler, a fellow Republican. And you have said you would never, ever... Um, bash Republicans, but you also have said that you don't have a deep knowledge of the issues facing New Mexicans, and your only issue is uh, the weather. Okay, I, you like can you reply to, to what about... he has asked so far. 
did he ask something? I'm trying to figure out exactly what it is. Look, a couple of things here, and this kind of gets to where Jay Block is. Number one, Jay, here's what I say, and you know this to be true. Before I got in this race, you made a phone call to my alleged, you know, to the alleged Jay McCleskey, right? You did. You made the phone call and tried to hire him. So all this political garbage, it's enough. Nobody cares. Jay, people cannot afford to buy groceries. They cannot afford to fill their tank with gas. And you sit here and you talk about these inside baseball ridiculous issues. And, and this is why your campaign has not gone anywhere, because you don't take the time to ask people what they're going through. You take more time to list off your alleged political accomplishments versus the everyday struggles that people in this state have. And we see it all the time. We see it in Santa Fe, too. We have a bunch of leaders in this state who live in this cocoon and they care for themselves. And if you go around the state and ask people their biggest concern, it's that politicians don't listen anymore. And that kind of tone deaf accusation that you just went with, it doesn't serve okay. anybody well. Your one minute is up. Thank you. We will now move to closing statements and we're going to begin with Greg Zanetti. I'll tell you this, New Mexico, you don't build by focusing on weakness. You have to focus on strengths. And New Mexico has amazing strengths. We have natural resources that America needs. And wouldn't it be nice for America to say, thank goodness for New Mexico, instead of saying, how much can we get from the federal government? But we also have brilliant minds in this state. And what's coming in nanotechnology, quantum computing, artificial intelligence, that was all born here. You combine wealth from the earth, natural resources, with brilliant minds, miracles happen. But we have to add one more piece. We have to connect up and this isn't religious speech, but we have to start acting with more honor, integrity, decency, truth in government. We have to start trusting the people more. When you combine those three things, New Mexico will go from worst to first. If you believe that, then vote Greg Zanetti for governor. And thank you, KOAT, for sponsoring me today. Ms. Maharg, you are next. To my fellow New Mexicans, con todo el amor le voy a decir que inflation is destroying our families ability to flourish. New Mexico has natural resources that we need desperately. I'll see to it that our resources are available and we'll remove any unnecessary regulations. Crime is at the top of, the, of everybody's mind as well. We need to we need to also fix that. I'm committed to put more police on the streets to do whatever it is that we fix our borders, elect really good people. We need to get behind people that all of our representatives and judges, we need to bring them in by immigration. Like I said, if you sneak in, we're going to arrest you, send you back out. Our failing schools are inexcusable and they turn to our strong economy. So the thing is this, we have many problems in our state, and I have said this before, but the biggest one is just like Zanetti, Greg Zanetti said, you know, our biggest one is that we have turned our backs on God. We really have. And we expect that everything is going to be fine. We turn back our backs on God, say it's okay to murder children in the womb, and then we expect his blessings. We need to remember that this country was based on biblical principles, and we need to return to that. And until then, nothing. Representative Dow, your closing statement, please. You know, as, as a young mom, I saw my community was hurting. So I rolled up my sleeves and I got to work creating opportunities for vulnerable populations to leave behind government dependency and to move into self-sufficiency. And I see that same need for our state. It's time to elect a proven job creator, an educator, a, a leader, a conservative leader in our community and our state to get the job done. I'm the only candidate in this field that's taken on MLG and the radical left and have been effective this is our time, our opportunity to have a course correction, to set bad government aside and lay a conservative foundation of success for our state. We've got to get this right. This is our chance as a state. I am the candidate ready to lead in the fight. And Mr. Block, you have a minute as well. Thank you for uh, having us all on here today. And uh, you have a critical decision to make, New Mexico. You can see the professional politicians that are attached to the political elites and the swamp and the corruption in this state. And you're tired of it. This is why our campaign, uh, what Mr. Ron Katie failed to tell you, is we won the state pre-primary convention under grassroots level. We don't try to buy campaigns and buy elections like they do. And here's what I'll do for you. In the first seven minutes, I will overturn with executive orders the 3030 land grab I will overturn critical race theory and make sure boys compete with boys and girls compete with girls. I will also sign executive orders banning forced vaccine and vaccine passports. I am the only candidate that has a record of success in this race by reducing crime 
reducing unemployment, making Santa Barbara County the fastest growing county in Rio Rancho, the number one place to live in Corrales. Is the safest place to live. That is the future of what New Mexico needs. I ask for your support. Block for New Mexico dot com. Thank you. And Mr. Ronchetti, your closing statements. Thanks very much to Channel 7, and thanks for all the people who are asking questions, and thanks to my fellow candidates. I know when we sit out here and you see people going back and forth and you think to yourself, you know, why do they say these things back and forth to each other? Because you need to know exactly who's going to stand up and fight for you. And most of all, you need to know who has the opportunity to take on Michelle Lujan Grisham and beat her. And we are the campaign that will do that. We have seen issue after issue where she has led this state into a horrible position, whether it be crime or the border or the economy or our schools. And we need to be able to take our message across this state and create a movement, a movement on values, which is built on so many people coming together and saying, we can do this and we can change things, but we have to change out a governor and we have to change a legislature who no longer listens to you. We're the campaign to do that. We would be honored for your support and we appreciate your time. And to the five GOP candidates, thank you for participating in this debate. The election is June 7th. You can vote now by requesting an absentee ballot. It must be returned no later than 7 p.m. on Election Day. And you can early vote until Saturday, June 4th. To find a voting center, just go to nmvote.org. A voter guide is posted on koat.com. On the ballot, New Mexicans will also vote for a new attorney general. Jeremy Gay is the only Republican running. He'll face off with either Brian Colon or Raul Torres the two Democrats competing in the primary. You can watch them debate live here on KOAT Wednesday at 6 Thank you for joining us tonight for the debate for the Republican candidates in New Mexico's gubernatorial election. Good night.